<clears throat> Before we go on into the next section, let me read you a little passage from a retreat Father Matteo gave in Canada. In Canada, they were, I have to tell you this, uh, he was giving this retreat in uh, Montreal, in the, August 26th to September 1st, 1945, to 250 superiors, 250 religious superiors of um, congregations in Canada. Anyway, he speaks of the Mass, and he gives this story on this little meditation on the Mass, which concerns, well, which applies to all of us, during the other war, so the First World War, a religious deacon was hit by a shell and seriously wounded. Slowly he got over it. Three years later, impotent and infirm, barely able to speak, even to walk, he asked his mother to lead him to Rome to obtain from the Pope the grace to become priest. The Pope asked him, what will you have more? You cannot preach? You cannot do the catechism? No, Holy Father, but my chalice and my wounds to save souls. But you cannot go in mission. You cannot give the sacraments. Holy Father, priest, I beg you to save souls. You're invalid. An invalid priest or invalid deacon. What's the difference? Oh, Holy Father, Priest, priest, I beg you, my chalice and my wounds, the wound, the blood of my wounds in my chalice, and I will save more souls. The Pope got him examined by a doctor, a Jesuit, and a bishop. Unless that Jesuit was a bishop and a doctor, doesn't say here. But, um, to find out if this great uh, wounded could validly and decently offer the Mass, and permission was granted. What an apostolate. Could you have the same apostolic prayer, your sufferings, your wounds, your agonies, your responsibilities, all that in the chalice for souls. Beautiful, you know, the, the perseverance of these men who, who want to become priests. These are religious um, in the society, I think it would be a little bit difficult, but in a monastery, it's certainly possible um, to be ordained for the Mass, ad misam. Our dear Father Lapra, such a heroic soul, the first year of his life was ordained ad misam. He who was a genius, but could not hear confession. He only did one year of theology, so he had to catch up by himself because he thought he was going to die. But, um, but he could offer the Mass. As uh, Father Laurent said, uh, as the, the argument that they used with the Archbishop, that was 1986, he said, well, he's been a victim long enough. He deserves to be a priest now. I hope you're familiar with the book Todo Nada, something you must read. There's a new edition that came out in French, a little bit uh, augmented. You have to read this book. He's one of our priests who died uh, after more than 130 operations. Really, all the marks of heroic virtue. Well, he had... Uh, he died twice. He had a medical death on the night of Holy Thursday, 1982. And uh, his mother said... His mother was called to the hospital. He had been sick for a long time. When his mother arrived, she arrived at the room, and just at the moment when the nurses were picking him up from his bed, and she said, he was like a broken doll. He was, he, he was, he was dead, he was purple. And they rushed him to the emergency room, and then for four hours, they tried to resuscitate him. He was, he was dead. Medically, he was dead. Everything was flat, dead. But they're trying everything. As a young man, he was... 23 years old, and so they, 
they plugged him on the machines there, but the body was dead. Anyway, for about four hours, he was completely uh, out. There's some, something mysterious whether the heart started to beat again, I don't know. But uh, the next morning, Archbishop Lefebvre arrived in the room. He came from Eco, and it was a good Friday morning, about 7, 7 o'clock in the morning. The moment Archbishop Lefebvre walked in, Henry opened his eyes. And that could be a miracle of Archbishop Lefebvre. He, he, he recovered his senses. He saw the Archbishop, the Archbishop came, how are you, whatever. Then uh, the Archbishop, you know, after a moment, not to fatigue him, so we gave him his blessing, went out to the door, put his hand on the handle, and then came back, hugged him, and went out. You know, that's Archbishop Lefebvre, the real father. Anyway, it is only, well, I found out the day of his funeral, that maybe father knew before, but uh, on the, the day of his funeral, in the graveyard there of Eco, near the Caveau, Father Lové, who was his spiritual director, was walking with a sheet of paper in his hand. And I said, what's that? And he says, have you, look at this, look at this. What is this? It was a, just an oil sheet of paper with some scribbling on it, which were notes he had written in January, so January 93, a few months before, while he was in intensive care, he had not been able to hold a pen for a few months. But there in the hospital that day, he got this impulse of grace. He says, write down. Write down the graces you have received. And he started writing down a few things. And then his pen just fell off his hand. He couldn't do it anymore. And in that, on that page, he says, he, he tells of his conversion as a young man, the grace he received, the grace of mental prayer. Before he was a seminarian, he was doing at least an hour of meditation a day. When he was a seminarian, I mean, I was with him as a seminarian, he would do two to three hours of meditation in a seminary. When he went to Albano, so the first month, because in January he, was, he went to hospital, but say from September to December, Many, many nights, he spent the whole night in the chapel. The chapel door was just across his bedroom. And uh, the sign that it was truly mystical, truly from God, is he was never tired. If you try it and you fall asleep during the classes, you have to go and knock at the door and excuse yourself, you know. But you have to, you have to sleep. It's part of our rule to sleep. He had special graces. But he would spend all night in the chapel. He had graces of of union with God. But uh, so, and he wrote on that piece of paper that on that night of Holy Thursday, he, when, when he died, his first death, he said he saw his two funerals. Two funerals. And uh, it was only understood after his funeral by Father Collet, his great friend, because he had a funeral in Geneva and then he had a funeral in Ecom. But he saw himself, so Father Lapra saw himself in Econ. You've seen pictures of Econ, you may have been there, where the car park is there, where now we have the Cavo, the tomb of the Archbishop. He was above where the Calvary is. At that time, in 1982, there were no Calvary. But he was standing in front of the Calvary, in front of the crucifix. And, and out of the sight of our Lord, all of a sudden, like a a fountain of fire came out and went straight to his stomach. He's like a red-hot poker that just entered into my stomach. And I heard that voice, Sitio. And, and, and there was a question asked, do you want to suffer for the church and for the society? And he said yes. He, he had to give a consent. It's all mystical, but it, 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 was, it was a question and an answer required. He said yes. And it is about that time that the Archbishop came in and he woke up. But uh, 
that is the grace, you know, and then he lived another, what, 11 years. Uh, you must read his, you have to read him. He, he's one of ours, you know, and it's heroic, heroic what he lived. Let's move on to the preface. We can follow the Stations of the Cross. The preface is very solemn. First station. Jesus is condemned to death. We go back to the angels. Because every preface ends, the second half of the preface, there's always this mention of the angels. Angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, thrones and dominations. And when we go to Mass, there's this whole dimension of angels. The angels are there. there we spoke about it at Christmas, the, the Gloria, the Mundacor, the Gloria. And now we're about to start the, the canon, and we mention four or five choirs of angels. There's a special choir of angel that deals with the worship of God, the choir of thrones. Seraphim, cherubim, thrones. The thrones are, if you want, the altar boys of God. They take care of the worship. And they assist the priests at Mass. Uh, the thrones. And so you can attend Mass. One day you can follow Mass. You close your book, follow Mass with your guardian angel. Think the whole Mass. Just imagine... You, what is your guardian angel thinking when the Mass goes on? Because the, our Lord, we see in the Apocalypse, in the Apocalypse, we see the angels are fighting with the human on earth, with the elect. They're fighting the demons and those who serve the demons, 666, and those who serve the beasts. They're fighting, but they're fighting for what cause? They're fighting for the Lamb. They're fighting for our Lord, for the Messiah. So the angels are at the service of the Lamb. You read the Apocalypse, it's, it's all over the place. And so we want to sing with them. Holy, 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 sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. That's the, the hymn, that's what the angels say in heaven. Gloria in excelsis Deo, sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. Sanctus, Fulton Sheen, remember, says, Behold your mother... So there's something about Our Lady in the Sanctus. She is the Holy One. There's a meet, and so the meeting of Jesus and Mary. <laughs> Don't forget, our Lord is suffering all his passion first for Our Lady, because she's the Immaculate. She alone is worth the whole passion. And then what happens after Jesus met Our Lady, according to our devotion, but the Bible speaks of Simon of Cyrene, and Catholic devotion has added Veronica. And Benedictus, Palm Sunday, in minutes, is going to be Holy Thursday. So the preface is Palm Sunday. Consecration is Holy Thursday and Good Friday. So it's not days here, it's minutes. So, the canon. And now we're going to pray in silence. Oh, we're asking the faithful to unite themselves, but the priest himself, in a way, disappears from the assembly, like Moses on Mount Sinai, to find himself face to face with God. Or the apostles on Mount Tabor. In troibo ar altare dei. Everything in the sacraments and everything in the Holy Eucharist, everything, you know, is, is symbolic. Everything means something. And uh, sometimes, as St. Thomas says, the priest continues alone, the prayer, because it corresponds to the proper office of the priest to offer donai preches, gifts and prayers for the people. Sometimes he says publicly. Like, uh, so when he prays that loud voice, the collect, for instance, 
he prays in his name and in the name of the church, the name of the universal church, the people. Sometimes there are parts that correspond to him as priest, by his priestly power, and that is the oblation and the consecration, so the offertory and the consecration. Sometimes the priest starts and the people continue. We have the, the credo, the, the gloria, so or here the Dominus Obiscum, we, we catch the attention of the people and we want their consent. They say, Amen. Amen. Say yes. And, uh, but you see, sometimes he prays inside the very last sentence. The priest says certain things in silence, especially during that part that we are coming now. During Holy Thursday night and Good Friday, everybody was afraid. They were just you know, murmuring, are you with him or what? You know, they, or they had abandoned him. The silence. The silence of contemplation. We have also that silence. He speaks very, very little during the whole Passion. Obviously, Martin Luther understood that. That's important to explain to people when you explain the problems with the new mass and the errors of the new mass. Why did Martin Luther put everything at loud voice? It's because of what St. Thomas is saying here. Because he denied it. He denied that there was a difference between the people and the priest. We're all priests. Everybody is priest. And then he turned around and says, nobody is priest. There's not, no such thing as the sacrament of holy orders. So, if speaking, or if reciting the prayers of the Mass at loud voice equals praying in the name of the Church, well, let's say all the Mass at loud voice, even the consecration, because it is the consecrations, the, the people together that brings Christ present, like they say in the new Mass. That was the mind of Luther. You see it, how a little, just a question of volume, can have theological, deep theological consequences. And it's true. It's true. <coughs> I just want to add now on the insensation, or the insensing, which is part of our sacred liturgy. We have spoken about the incense as a sacrifice the incense, we offer incense only to God because we come only from God. It is a mark of respect. We are temples of the Holy Ghost and we respect others as well. One of the society's characteristics will be to re respect towards baptized souls and the respectful treatment of all sacred things, especially that which touches the sacred action par excellence the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. In sensing, let me read to you to finish a few lines from Monseigneur de Ségur. He has some beautiful thoughts here. At the High Mass, there's a very beautiful ceremony, full of mysteries like all the others, which we call the incensing. There are four incensing during the Mass, the High Mass. First, before the introit. Second, before and after the Gospel. Third, which is the more solemn, at the offertory. And fourthly, during the elevation. The thurible, which should be of silver or vermeil, no, I say vermeil, or gold, signify the sacred humanity of our Lord. The fire inside is the Holy Ghost, which filled his sacred heart. The, the blessed incense which the priest throws on the burning charcoals is the prayer, the adorations, by which Jesus constantly honored his Father in an absolutely divine manner. United to, the Holy, united to Jesus and the Holy Ghost by grace, the angels and the, in heaven and the Christians on earth unite their adorations and prayers to that adoration and ineffable prayer of the Son of God. Christ prays in us 
I was telling you, Don Marmion insists a lot on that. He prays for us. He prays as our priest, says St. Augustine. So the smoke and the perfume of the incense represent both the prayer of Jesus Christ in himself and the prayer of Jesus Christ through his angels and in his saints. We must put three spoonfuls of incense in honor of the Blessed Trinity, to whom are addressed all the adorations in the Church, but also to represent the adorations of the Patriarchal Church. So three spoonfuls, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but also one to recall all the adorations from Adam to Moses, the Patriarchal Church. Then, from Moses to our Lord, the uh, Levitical, the Mosaic law. And then, the Christian church, from our Lord till the end of the world. From the first to the second coming of Christ. Beautiful. Before the interit, the priest incenses first three times the cross. That's the universal adoration of all the elect, of the patriarchal, Mosaic, and Christian church. Addressed to the Holy Trinity. Then he incenses 12 times on the epistle side and 12 times on the gospel side. Enveloping, so to speak, the holy altar with the smoke of the incense. That is the prayer, the adoration of the angels and saints. Of first, of the Old Testament, represented by the 12 patriarchs and the 12 prophets. Then by the angels and saints of the evangelical law, represented by the 12 apostles. In fact, in the Apocalypse, St. John shows all these saints under the figure of the 24 uh, old men vested in white and ador adoring the Lamb of God, immolated, although alive on the throne of his glory. So these 24 blows of incense are rep represent that. Moreover, this atmosphere of incense, of blessed incense, uh, the church, by this atmosphere of blessed incense, wants to sanctify, penetrate, penetrate all things, deify everything uh, that is used for the holy sacrifice, particularly the bread and wine, the priests, the ministers, and the faithful, who will be united to Christ by holy communion. So incense, reserved to God alone, expresses here, perfect sanctification, the deification of the Christian in Jesus Christ. At the offertory, the priest incenses the bread and the wine, honoring in advance as true God, he who in a moment will change their substance into his humanity. Uh, well, he jumped to the incident and comes back to the gospel here. To recall the gospel, to recall that Jesus is priest in the priest. Okay. The deacon represents the church. The deacon representing the church <clears throat> incenses, so three doubles. The priest, just like the priest incenses the gospel, three doubles. So the priest and the gospel receive the same number of uh, blows of incense to show the unity between the priest and our Lord. <clears throat> the fourth incensing is by the clerics at the foot of the altar during the elevation. This is clear. It's the symbol of the adoration and the love of all the faithful in the church of heaven and the church of the earth. So the various ranking of the bishop, the priest, the deacons, the subdeacon, the ministers, the clergy, the people, all this corresponds to our Lord living, present and living in all his members, but at different degrees. The multiplicity of vocations. And it ends here. This is, so this is the meaning, the deep meaning of the, the various incensing 
at a high mass. So it is a, you can see this practical sense here at the end. It is a real duty of religion to only use on the altar very good quality incense. Here, like everywhere else, they have tried to improve, to refine on the antique usage of the church, of the Roman church, instead of uh, uh, the incense, whatever, the uh, like gum, the, the polarized incense, like in the old Roman that the Roman church uses, which produce a magnificent white smoke, uh, embalm. You know, now they have imagined, I don't know what kind of darkish or reddish incense, which only gives an invisible smoke, black, and grabbing to the throat and the head. <laughs> That's, it is Gallican incense. <laughs> He's French. <laughs> Uh, in Rome, as in all the churches in the Basilica of St. Peter, we use the most pure incense of Arabia without any mix. It's produced in very fine powder. It gives a, a perfect, beautiful cloud of uh, white vapor and of exquisite perfume. When the Holy Father, he's writing in 1870, when the Holy Father makes the insensation of the Pontifical Mass, he disappears through this great, this beautiful cloud of incense, which soon surrounds the altar and climbs towards the dome of the immense basilica. That moment is particularly grandiose and is very impressive. What do we have at the beginning of the canon? We have the memento of the living. St. Paul, who says to pray for one another, St. Paul encouraged people you know, pray to, for one, let us pray for the, at the end of so many of his epistles, I greet you, pray for me, and I pray for you, and so that's the memento. And the communicantes, then we have the 12 apostles. We recall all the different saints, so we need to unite ourselves to his passion, to his cross like the saints have done. There is a, a video recording of a mass of Padre Pio, 1957, I think, where he says mass outdoors in the San Giovanni because the crowd is already too big. But he's there and he can... It's a simple mass, but you see, especially during the canon there, he stops and and he's breathing and he kind of wipes his eyes because he, he's living the passion. He's there in the agony, the, the, the whole passion. He's, he's living it. Well, by faith, we ought to live the passion at every Mass. When you hear the bell ringing at the Ankijitur, something which personally I like to associate with Our Lady, I told you, kissing the altar, the pattern is a sign of Our Lady. We'll see that after the Our Father. Uh, but also the bells. The first bell at Mass is at the Sanctus. And Fulton Sheen said, Behold your mother. Uh, traditionally, the Sanctus is also the meeting of Jesus and Mary. So when you hear the bells, think of Our Lady at that moment of the Passion. So now we have the Hankijitur, just before the consecration. Our Lady arrives on top of Calvary. She's following in a crowd behind. And then she arrives at the foot of the cross, just before Jesus is crucified. O oh Lord, we beseech thee to accept this oblation. So, but here we have something very, very biblical, which is the priest puts his hands over the chalice and the host. We saw that in Leviticus. And there's something I just discovered very recently, <clears throat> very recently from Monsignor de Segur, when he speaks about this. So laying the hands represents, so 
substitute is substituting the victim. But if I lay my hand, it also, if there is a sunshine, it makes shadow. And so it's an image of the Holy Ghost as well. So we have the Holy Ghost. And actually, this is used in the Eastern liturgy. It's a very crucial moment in the Eastern Mass, Catholic Eastern rites, where um, they call it, I think they call it the epicle epiclesis, <laughs> where the coming of the Holy Ghost just before the consecration. It's not the consecration, but it's the immediate preparation to the consecration. Consecration, when the priest raises the host, when the priest raises the chalice, is the cross being raised. And when you see the priest making genuflections, think of Our Lady adoring Jesus on the cross. How, are, how instructive and enlightening to see our Lord on the cross fulfilling all the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes which are the like the, the, the summit with the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the Beatitudes which are with the fruits of the Holy Ghost, which are truly gives us that joy, their beatitu Beatitudo. We are created to be happy. That's the goal of life. Come ye blessed into, you know, blessed in my Father, receive the kingdom that has been prepared for you before the creation of the world. We are not created to, we are not created to suffer. We are created to be happy Suffering is the way of happiness, the door to, to, to heaven. But ultimately, uh, you know, our ultimate goal is the beatific vision, beatific vision, the vision that will make us heavenly happy. If we want to share in the beatitudes, which are the crowning effect of the Holy Ghost and soul, we must also share in our Lord's life and in his cross. So, it is important to read this, to understand all of them. Poverty in spirit, on the cross. Meekness, on the cross. Tears, blessed are they who mourn. Our Lord saw that through his suffering, you know, he saw the good thief, he saw Mary Magdalene. Yes, he saw his mother, fruit of his sacrifice, the first fruit of his sacrifice, his own mother. Why is she immaculate? She was purchased on credit, as we would say today. She was redeemed in advance. You know, buy now, pay later. Well, that's Our Lady. She was immaculate because the payment would come, what, 48 some years later. But so when our Lord was carrying his cross, was being scourged, was, was nailed, all of this was for his beloved mother's soul. But he, when you think of that, you know, it's, you can do a whole meditation on the passion by just thinking of our Lord paying the price of the soul of his mother, who is worse than all the angels and all the saints together, more than all of them together, on the first moment of her immaculate conception. You see our Lord you know, doing this for his beloved. Read the, the Canticle of Canticle. And you understand it from that angle between Jesus and Mary. It's, it's extraordinary. Well, these tears, our Lord wept tears of blood for his mother. Hunger and thirst after justice. There's the cross that reestablishes that justice is <clears throat> by the blood of his cross. And uh, Mel Gibson in the movie, that's at the moment of the crucifixion, he, he puts that as if the cross was soaked with blood. You see the cross, the tip of the nails, and then his blood just dipping underneath the cross, like the, the cross like a sponge. By the blood of his cross, like the cross was alive with himself, he was one with his cross. Yes. And when you read the testimonies of martyrs, in Kyoto, there's a famous, they call it the Great Martyrdom. It was, uh, I think, October 19, 1619. There were about 55 of the Christians were arrested, put on crosses on one side of the river. 
There's a stone there where a monument where the crosses were. And there's about 10 or 20,000 people on the other side of the river. Just imagine not going to Mass. Imagine going to witness the martyrdom of your parents, of your brother, your cousins, your friends. They're across the river. They're tied to posts. And along, among, around the, the post there, they've put some uh, you know, wood and all kind of things to burn. And then they start lighting the fires. And the, the 10,000 people start singing the Magnificat. They start singing the Te Deum. That's history. And there was one cross, you may have seen it in our Asian newsletter. There was one cross, there was a blessed Tekla. There's this lady, she was pregnant. And she had her four children with her. Three were tied with her. And the other one was about 11 years old, was on under the cross, just a few, a few steps away. And her husband was on another cross. The whole family there burnt alive. And she was holding the youngest in her arms. And uh, the older child there, after a while, her, the ropes got loose, whatever, and the child ran to her mother, and just clinging to her, and the mother just took her in there. And then just don't worry, you know, offer it up to Jesus, and think of heaven. And, and then did he, did, they all disappeared in a big cloud of smoke, whatever. And a moment later, when the, the smoke abased, and they saw the mother dead, still holding the baby. But it's amazing when you read the testimonies of these, these Christians. They're, they're newly converts. But they, their knowledge of the cross, their knowledge of the mystery of suffering is, is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And it puts us to shame when we have to make sacrifices. Yeah. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. There, misericordia, the heart that leans on misery, the mercy of God. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. That heart that was wounded, you know, the, the sacred heart of Jesus. Pater, Pater. And every pure heart seek after that, that refuge. What is it in the, the preface of the Sacred Heart? You know, say, that's for the penitent, and for the just, it's, it's a protection for the penitent, it's, a, it's an oasis where we can be refreshed. Come. There's a story, this earthquake that took place in China. I presume she's a pagan mother, because that whole area is very pagan, I mean, very few Catholics. What a pagan mother can do is... It, you know, we, we remain dumbfounded. They found so this, this all this whole town collapse, and all the houses all the massive earthquake, eight, eight or seven point eight on the Richter scale. And uh, we don't know how many dead, few hundred thousand certainly could be more than that. Anyway, they one mother got caught under the debris with her baby, six months, three months old baby, I don't know. And uh, so a baby, and she was still breastfeeding the baby when, at that age. Anyway, she got caught there and under, you know, a whole building, whatever. She said, we'll never get out of this place. You know? And she saw she was going to die. But, you know, she gave all her milk to her baby, and the baby was crying for more. She had nothing. Well, she slit one of her veins to feed her child. Pie pelicani. That's exactly that. Our Lord opened his heart to feed us. But, but you see, a pagan mother, she said, I'm going to die. My child has to survive. I'll give my blood to feed my child. You know, it's extraordinary. And if, if a pagan soul has that, that uh, generosity to die for her little, the baby survived. They, they managed to save the baby's life. He, they came a few days later. The mother was dead. The baby was still alive. How much more the infinite God, the sacred heart of Jesus, really is dying to give us his blood 
to save us, to, to vivify us, to quicken us, to resuscitate us. Beautiful stories. The Beatitudes are fulfilled with an unsurpassed perfection on the cross. And these simple Christians in these mission lands, they did it. They did it. The more we practice the Beatitudes, the more readily we will accept our crosses in imitation of our Lord. And, the ha and that's the, the irony. The happier we will be. That's the, the Beatitude. We shall be and the more joy we'll fill ourselves. The priest lifting up his eyes to heaven. To heaven. Until now, that is the recitation of the institution. What happened? But now we're changing roles at that moment. Full stop, period. My, my role stops and our Lord walks in. Hoc est corpus, hoc est enim, corpus meum. This is my body. We have mentioned before the my is not my. And that is why here, you know, faith transcends Latin. Because meum, you say meum, but if you translate, it's, it's not yours. It's not yours. So, it's going to be, you know, it's really the, the son who offers a sacrifice to the father. So it's his sacrifice and the church's sacrifice. The corpus, of course, the first meaning. Okay, the corpus is our Lord's, our Lord's body. Of course, it's this transubstantiation. Okay, it's corpus meum. It is our Lord speaking and transubstantiating the bread into his body. Yes, of course. The mystical body. The church is a body. And St. Paul speaks of, you know, suffering, uh, completing in his flesh what is lacking, you know, for his body. We heard St. Pius X telling us that when Our Lady conceived our Lord's humanity in her, at the same time, she conceived by, because he's the head of the mystical body, she, conceived, she became the mother of the church. So that body, that sacrifice is the sacrifice of our Lord, and at the same time is the sacrifice of the church. That is very important to understand that, the sacrifice of the church. The infinite power of God's words. Because if you realize, the Mass is the consecration. There's a story of Cardinal Mizenti, who was in the concentration camps, and he thought he was going to be sentenced to death. He had managed to get a few, a few grains of grapes, a few grapes that he had uh, fermented in a little, uh, whatever, little cup of some sort. And he had a bit of bread that he managed to save. And as the judge and the soldiers were drag him along and there's a moment they stop to waiting for more instruction. He just turned around and he consecrated. This is my body, this is my blood. And he communicated. <clears throat> but what if you think for a second? The power of this word, this is my body. It's a little, little sentence. This is my blood. All the fruits of the mass in the history of the last 2,000 years. The Christian civilization. The... Uh, the Christian law, the Christian society, the magnificent cathedrals, the art. There's, there's a beautiful talk that was in Kansas City Congress a couple years ago, where the Dr. I think Clarendon, I think he said, the mass is the source of art, literature, music, architecture. The whole Christian culture is, it flows from that simple word. This is my body. And when our Lord pronounced these words, 
he, being God and having this, this divine knowledge and an infused knowledge in his human soul, he saw every single priest in the history of the world that would consecrate. Because we are only the mouthpiece. It is as if our Lord is at the, has the microphone and we are the speakers. So our Lord, our Lord saw every single consecration until the end of the world. On, on in, uh, the city, parishes, monasteries, in, in the igloos, in the North Pole, in the desert, in a plus 50 and minus 50. He saw the priest saying masses for one soul, for nobody, or for millions of souls. And our Lord saw in the trenches, in the war, on ships, everywhere, priests had said mass in all over the world. Our Lord saw these priests, you know, facing death to bring the blessed sacrament. And, and these priests stuck in prison, like uh, so many missionaries, you know, priests in, in Russia or China, or whatever, for years. There was one, this one priest, I think it's, uh, what is his name, Alagiani, something like this. Uh, uh, my prisons... Uh, sorry, uh, my paradise in Soviet prison. Mon paradis dans les prisons soviétiques. Thing. And he says, it's an Italian priest who was there in Russia. He managed to, he consecrated at one time, he had, he had 10 hosts. That's all he had. So he consecrated them. He had them in a little niche in the wall there. And he, he lived with these hosts like for I think 15 years or something like that. And every day you take a little particle or every Sunday. But that was his life. Our Lord saw that. Our Lord saw, you know, these priests saying the masses all over the world in the history. Uh, so he saw... He saw every single mass. He saw every single communion in the history of the world. Think of the billions of communion. And the priests bringing communion on the trenches and in all these places, the, the <coughs> thousands and, and millions of children receiving communion and the Eucharistic crusade and so on. Our Lord saw that when he said these words, this is my body. That is, yeah. that is just one divine word. This is my body. And you see the fruits of that divine word the fruits of grace, the fruits of civilization, the fruits of all kinds, even miracles, it's all there. That's one word. One word. And, and so, what does that mean? I mean, at the moment of consecration, there's no more time. Or there's no more succession of time. At the moment of consecration, all the priests in history are connected to our Lord. It's the moment of the consecration. And so, and it's very, it's very encouraging to think of that because it is our Lord who's consecrating. And our Lord is in heaven now, but he, he said these words at the Last Supper. That's why you can close your eyes at Mass at any moment, especially at a consecration. And... If you remember the image of the, the microphone and the speaker, is that at the consecration you can think of Padre Pio saying Mass. You can hear Padre Pio. You can hear Don Bosco. You can hear Francis Xavier. You can hear John de Brebeuf. You can hear Saint Augustine. Saint Thomas, Saint Dominic, Saint Benedict, Saint, Saint uh, what is Ignatius, Francis Xavier, Archbishop Lefebvre, Padre Pio, Pius X. You can think we we are one. We are we are all united to that Calvary. Calvary is here. You can hear our Lord. We're all saying Mass at the same time. Because it's Jesus who consecrates. It's not me. It's Jesus who consecrates. This is my body. I don't this is the body of Christ. No, this is my. My is not Father Couture, it's Jesus Christ speaking through me. And so and that that that's a it it opens a, it's really the holy of holies. Once you start grasping or meditating upon this. But the Mass is not the same thing anymore. And then, having said this, let's go to reverse approach. Change the Mass. Destroy the Mass. Mm -hmm. And you've destroyed the sacrifice of the universal church. Not just Mr. Smith's 
personal prayer. It's not Father Smith's prayer. It's the whole Catholic Church. From A. Adam and Abel all the way to the end of the world, those who will come after us, all the saints, the angels, the souls in purgatory, everybody's offering this sacrifice. And so that's why Archbishop of Faith said that by, by touching the Mass, you know, they, they touch everything. And Luther was right. Destroy the Mass, you destroy the Catholic Church. He was right. He was right. It's really Ocas Corpus Meum. It's the sacrifice of the Church as well. It is our Lord offering up all his priests and all the, the work of the priests, all the work of the Catholic Church, the hospital, the children, the schools, everything, offering up to his Father. My Father, this is my body, the Church. It's, a, it's a profound. We will never fathom enough these words of this consecration. It's infinite. It's infinite. So our Lord was thinking of all the masses. He was thinking of every, God knows, trillion communions in the history of the church. How many communions? And all these, these souls, you know, making heroic efforts to go to receive Holy Communion in the history. And then, then our Lord took the precious blood, the, the wine, the cup, the chalice, also giving thanks, in the act of giving thanks, as we saw. So the words that follow are the words in thanksgiving, returning to the Father what he had received from the Father. Same thing. Our Lord sees in that uh, precious chalice, he sees the, uh, his blood. Already, uh, our Lord cannot wait. He cannot wait. I have the power to lay down my life, the power to take it back, the proof, the Last Supper. Our Lord is sacrificed himself, by himself. He does not wait the soldiers to beat him up and to nail him. He, he himself, as he is alive, he offers this, his own sacrifice of his body and blood. And, and so he sees, of course, he, it's going to be painful. He's going to bleed to death, you know, the next, well, well 20 hours or so. Or so. And, uh, but more so, in that chalice, our Lord sees, and that's why we have the other words. No viet eterni testamenti, qui provobis et promultis effundetu. It is being shed. If I'm not mistaken, in the Greek it is in the, it's a, like a present continuous. It is being shed. being shed. And our Lord sees his blood, but the fruit of his blood. The fruit of his blood. Of course, he sees the martyrs, the rivers of blood, the, the ocean of blood of his martyrs who will die thinking of God gave his blood for me, well, blood for blood. I'm going to give my blood to him. Our Lord sees the fruit of his blood, which is the infinite number of baptisms. The baptisms. He sees the confessional lines, which are not miles long, which are centuries long. People kneeling to be bathed in that precious blood. This is my blood, which is being shed for you for you and for many. And our Lord sees these poor sinners, these, these good thieves, these St. Paul, these, these criminals, these whatever. Yes, I need that blood. Our Lord sees that. When, when he consecrates my blood, they, they need me. Just like a mother saying, my children need me. I cannot stay. I need to go. This is my blood. Archbishop Lefebvre has a, it's one of the most beautiful passages. What does this blood signify? It was not simply to shed blood that our Lord came on earth. That's the material side of it, the, the physical blood. It was because this blood is charity. The Holy Ghost made the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ 
flow. That, that, that charity is the Holy Ghost. It is his love. It is the sign of his charity for us. That is what our Lord's blood is. The effusion of blood signifies that our Lord pours forth his love in us, his Holy Spirit. The word diffuse, you have the fundere, diffundere. So there's a liquid. Our Lord, if you want, that precious blood is liquid charity, we would say, in modern language. And our Lord is eager to pour it, not for the material element of the blood, but for the spiritual meaning of it. It's pumped from his sacred heart, and he can't wait to pump it into our heart to make it sacred. The blood is charity. The blood is charity. It's, it's extraordinary. This insight of Archbishop Lefebvre is, you know, credidimus caritati. There you have the heart of the heart. The Holy Spirit leads us to God. It inclines us to do our duty, to keep the law of God, the law of command, the commandments of love, which is nothing else than the law of charity, the law of love. Love God, love your neighbor. That is our law. Our law. The blood of God is nothing other than a source of love. And we said love is to suffer. To suffer is to love. This is what charity is all about. This is what our Lord's blood gives us, signifies for us, and produces in us. And these are really inspired words, really, from our sacred, from our venerable founder. And finally, our Lord said the last words, which we repeat every day also. Whenever you will do this, do this for a commemoration. The second prayer after the consecration, we have, we're back to Genesis. Okay, Abraham, Genesis 4, Genesis 14 is uh, Melchizedek, okay, and Genesis 20, 20 something, Genesis, Abel, uh, into the chapter. 22. 22 is the sacrifice of Isaac. So that prayer has, uh, it, it tells you, when we, when we have the Mass, it's not just your prayer today. That's what I want you to, to try to, to feel, to understand, to, to, to grasp a little bit. I don't know if you have ever been to Europe in these Gothic cathedrals. Huge, got a hundred foot ceiling, like Notre Dame in Paris or others. You walk in there, especially if you have a chance to go, some of them, some of them are really in abandoned places, old monasteries, whatever, there's nobody there sometimes. I happened to be once walking in Fontevraud in France. You walk in there, I was alone in the evening, 8 p.m., and I was just standing at the door, and, the whole basilica there, I mean, it's a gigantic thing, you know, and uh, there's, a, there's a sense of awe. So what I want you to appreciate the Mass. When we go to Mass, you have to go, it's in your faith, in your soul, in your mind, but knowing all these things, you realize all these people, Abel, son of Adam, Okay, all the way to the apocalypse. It's the whole church in, in time, in history. The church with the angels. Now we're going to see with the souls in purgatory. The next prayer, the two prayers later. Okay. One detail I forgot to mention, which, uh, which uh, Monsignor de Sivio mentioned. Remember at the... Uh, at the offertory, the priest was holding the pattern like this. Although it was only bread, he was holding the host on the pattern. At the elevation, he's not lifting the host on the pattern. <coughs> he's holding the host in his hands. There's a reason. Monsignor de Sigur says, here's the fulfillment of the antique vision of the prophet Ezekiel, 
where Christ to come was shown him in the midst of the fire of the Holy Ghost, <coughs> carried by four great cherubim. He says seraphim, but he made a mistake. It's cherubim. <coughs> Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel chapter 10 is the famous vision of the four animals with four heads, four wheels. It's very mysterious. Full of eyes, then the head of a, the face of a man, of a bull, of a lion, of an eagle, the four evangelists. But these were cherubim. Verse, so Ezekiel 10, verse 14. And everyone had four faces. One face was the face of a cherub. Cherub is singular, cherubim is plural. Second face of a man, the third of a lion, the fourth of an eagle. The cherubims were, filled, were lifted up. This is the living creature I had seen by the river Kobar. Okay, when I stood, verse 17, and when they stood, these stood, when they were lifted up, these were lifted up, for the spirit of life was in them, so the Holy Ghost. And the glory of the Lord, and the glory, the glory of the Lord, okay, and these, and those, uh, glory, and those Messiah, the glory of the Lord went forth from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. So Monsignor de Sigur says, the four fingers of the priest holding the host represents the four cherubim, holding the glory of the Lord, which is Christ in the Holy Eucharist. You know, you need to stop and meditate on that. You read Ezekiel, then you stop, you think of the mouth, and you see the priest's hands lifting up the host. The church itself gives one tiny argument to practice following the Mass with the chrono chronology of the Passion. And that detail is the memento of the dead. The memento of the dead, where we recall people who have passed away, and you don't have that detail in your daily Missal. We have it on the Missal at the altar. Because the Missal on the altar has rubrics telling the priest what to do. You don't have that in your missile. You just have what the priest is doing, what's happening, but not the detail. You know, Father, make a genuflection, uncover the chalice, cover the chalice, open your hands, kiss the altar, turn around. That's all written in the book, but you don't have that. So what is that detail here? At the end of the Nobis Coque Peccatori, sorry, at the end of the Memento of the Dead, the liturgy says to the priest, bow your head when you say, Per Christum Dominum Nostrum. That's very odd. It's the only time in the whole liturgy, to my knowledge, that we bow our head without the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, we bow because of the word Jesus. We bow when we say per Christum Dominum Nostrum through Christ our Lord, we don't bow our head. We only bow we speak when we speak of our Lord when there's the name Jesus who liveth and reigneth this world without end, we don't bow. Through Christ our Lord, we don't bow. Except one place here. And why because the church wants to, to, like this, there's an overlap, a brief overlap, but it's so symbolic. The priest wants to, because we're talking about the memento of the dead, we're speaking about death. The priest, by bowing his head, expresses Jesus bowing his head on the cross, and bowing the head, he gave up the ghost. That's why, although there's not Jesus, why is there not the name of Jesus? I don't know. But the church that just has Per Christum Dominum Nostrum and tells the priest, Father, bow your head. To overlap the chronology of the sequence of the Passion and the Mass. 
So we had the elevation, and we have now Jesus bowing his head. And another immediate parallel, what does the priest do right away? Nobis quoque peccatoribus. He beats his chest. When Jesus bowed his head, that's when there was the earthquake. The earth quaked. The veil was torn from top to bottom. Okay, tombs, some tombs were open. And the centurion, beating his breast, said, truly, he was the son of man. So we say, nobis quoque peccatoribus. To express the movement of the soldier beating his chest as well at that moment. Truly, indeed, this was the son of man. So let us, through our Lord's sacrifice, let us strive to give ourselves without reserve to the Father, to the Holy Trinity. What happens at the moment of the consecration is truly the summit of the world. We can say, yeah, the world, the whole church, and of history. Every time the priest pronounces these words, we are literally on top of the world. And in all the meanings of the world, of the word, of the expression. <coughs> to accomplish this mystery, the priest turns towards the crucifix and towards God, like the high priest of old, who passed through a curtain once a year to be alone with God. And later on, he will return, bringing blessed to the faithful. So that was in the Old Testament. Today, too, after turning towards God, the priest turns back to the faithful for Holy Communion after the canon to give them Jesus Christ.